Hey, 302, I'm Jackie Ferris. It seems like everybody loves Hamilton the Musical. It's a runaway hit on Broadway, but do you know about the people it depicts in real life? We're talking about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, and they're the subject of a new exhibit here at Winter Tour Museum. Get ready to rock and roll. There's no singing here, but 302 is headed your way. Hey there, 302. It seems like everyone loves Hamilton the musical, but what about the facts behind the lyrics? We're at Winter Tour Museum to talk a little bit about a new exhibition called Hamilton and Burr, Who Wrote Their Stories. I'm joined now by Rebecca Duffy, who is the curator of the exhibition. Rebecca, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. It's so wonderful to have you guys here to, to see what we're doing with this project. So I know a lot of people really think about the duel between Hamilton and Burr, and the exhibition is from the day after and what happened after the duel, but can you talk a little bit about what led up to it? Absolutely. I think uh, the rivalry between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton has been at uh, the forefront of our minds recently. and. Uh, but there's still a lot of questions about how they got there and how these two massive political figures, the, the effective leader of the Federalist Party uh, and someone who almost became the, the president of the United States, got to the point where they were settling uh, their argument this way. Uh, the two actually were friends early on um, and often had a casual relationship. They, in fact, lived just down the block from each other and practiced law in the same city and had a very similar background in a lot of ways. Uh, but after uh, tensions rise between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, uh, as Hamilton uh, begins to zero in on Burr in many ways as a political leader, but also uh, with many questions uh, for him as an individual, the two take to the power of words, and Hamilton is consistently publishing in newspapers questions uh, about Burr and about the Democratic Republicans that just take Burr to the point that he can't have it anymore. So he said something that that Burr didn't like about his character, about him being dangerous, or what yeah. was that? Yeah, and, and that's, that's exactly it. Uh, Hamilton found Burr to be, uh, in reality, Burr was, was relatively maybe moderate for his period. Uh, and that was very terrifying for many of our founding fathers who had these really, really staunch visions for what the future should look like in the United States. Uh, and Hamilton found Burr's inability to, um, to clearly present his political ideas in all forums and in a uniform way as, as dangerous. And uh, so he wrote um, several times in newspapers that Burr ought to not be trusted with the reins of government. And in fact, it's that phrase, th those words, that crumble uh, a New York governorship election for Aaron Burr and are the spark for the duel itself. So the duel takes place not in New York, but in New Jersey, right? Yes. Um, and that's very important. So dueling was illegal, largely, um, actually by the 1600s, and it was certainly illegal uh, in the United States at the time. Uh, it was illegal in both New York and New Jersey, but New Jersey offered uh, a sort of more concealed and hidden place than the center of Manhattan for all of this to go down. And in fact, the ground that they used in Weehawken, um, which is covered by trees, quite accessible from New York City uh, by boat, had been used uh, several times, even uh, in, in the years running up to their duel for, to settle other disputes or affairs of honor, as they were called at the time. So Hamilton shot up, Burr shot straight, and hit Hamilton in the abdomen. Right? That's a good question. Um, actually, we don't really know for sure what happened that day because so few people were present. Because this was illegal, uh, the goal was to have as few people liable uh, as possible in case there was a legal case. And so we think uh, that Hamilton fired wide and we think that Burr maybe didn't fire quite as wide, uh, but we don't actually know who shot first. We don't know why, uh, who, who fired in earnest and who fired uh, in self-defense, right? We don't, we don't no, um, but the, at the end of the day, Hamilton shot ended up nowhere near Burr. 
and Burr's shot did hit Hamilton in the right hip, and that was a mortal wound. Now, as part of the exhibition, there's a letter from Burr to a doctor that was there. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. David Huzak is, is a really interesting figure and uh, he was a physician to both Hamilton and Burr. Uh, he served as the physician in attendance at the duel and actually spent much of the time down by the river so that he wasn't liable either. Uh, but when he heard uh, the gunshots, he rushed up uh, and, and collected Hamilton and, and brought him back to uh, New York City where Hamilton lived his last 36 or so hours. In that time, Burr also returned to his house house uh, and he penned a letter to Dr. David Hozak uh, requesting uh, Hamilton's condition and you can see in his letter the pain uh, as he writes it it's quite messy for his handwriting uh, it's very formal in tone for two people who know each other so well uh, Burr knew immediately that that this was not going to end well for him that he had made a, a grave error and this is kind of a turning point for not just his political career but his life Absolutely. Uh, so the letter that Burr, that Burr sends to Dr. David Hosack, we don't know if Hosack ever answers. We don't have the, the response, but we do know that by two o'clock the next day, Hamilton had, had died and Burr left almost immediately from New York. Uh, after you've killed the leader of the Federalist Party, uh, you can't expect to be getting many clients in New York City as a lawyer. He was sitting as vice president at the time, um, which I think is something that we tend to forget. And so he spent some time in Washington, D.C., filling out that position. And when it ended, he took to the West. Uh, when he took to the West, he started making some deals that wound up uh, wound up getting him into a situation where he was tried for treason um, and at that point after being acquitted for treason lived in exile for for almost a decade so the legacies of the two men are vastly different from this turning point so to speak absolutely yeah. and we're going to talk about that when we come back we'll be right back Hi, I'm Diane, current owner of the Brandywine Dance Shop, and I love dancing on the 302. Welcome back. We're talking about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, the duel and what happened afterwards. Now, let's talk a little bit about these two men's histories. Very different. I know that the wife of Alexander Hamilton, Eliza Hamilton, really worked hard to preserve his legacy. Absolutely. Uh, in, in the years that followed Hamilton's death, and, and Eliza lived about 50 years after Hamilton, uh, she ensured that we remembered some of the really fabulous things that he did. Uh, she loved Hamilton dearly and, and wanted his memory to represent his greatest accomplishments, uh, including some things that maybe sometimes we even forget, such as his authorship of George Washington's farewell address. Now, he also did the Federalist Papers. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah. He published a number of the Federalist Papers. In fact, he published the vast majority of them, uh, along with his partners, Madison and John Jay. And, and Eliza wanted to be sure that he was remembered as the mastermind behind that. You know, the Federalist Papers basically told people why they should ratify the Constitution, is that right? Yes, and, and Hamilton was a staunch advocate for ratifying the Constitution. Uh, the Federalist Papers in, in all of their entirety uh, are, are just one of the things that he did too. He gave a six hour talk to Congress to encourage them as well uh, and was sure to be out on the streets um, and making any connections he could. He was, uh, as many Federalists at the time were, uh, concentrated on ensuring that there was a document moving forward to establish this nation. Now, I know a lot of people recognize him every day. They see him every day on their $10 bill. Yep. But uh, he not only, he basically set up the, um, the treasury and took care of war debts. Talk to us about, you know, what he did for laying the foundation for our economy. Yes, Ham Hamilton is really the centerpiece of early American economy and much of uh, the way our economy functions today is a legacy of, of the work that he did. Uh, his ideas were radical at the time. Having the national government take over states' debts was something that the Democratic Republicans simply couldn't stomach. Uh, but he, he really laid the groundwork for having a central federal uh, reserve that managed debt both uh, on a national level and on an individual state level. Now as part of the exhibition you have a handkerchief that yeah. talks about him as a war hero. 
Yeah. What's that all about? Yeah, it may be something that we forget uh, sometimes too is that both Hamilton and Burr uh, were intimately involved in the American Revolution. They were young uh, and, and both had rose to prominence as generals. Hamilton uh, even served under Washington. And uh, the, the handkerchief that we see uh, really celebrates the relationship between the two of them as well as his uh, victories in war. So let's talk about Aaron Burr. You know, yeah. he wrote the letter. He knew that, you know, he shouldn't have done what he did. And from there, things just got steadily worse. Yeah. Uh, so at that point, uh, after Aaron Burr leaves Washington, D.C., he's no longer serving as the vice president. Um, he starts making his way around uh, what would have been the frontier, the western United States, things like places like Tennessee, um, along the Mississippi River, and all the way down to Louisiana. He starts making deals with different people, trying to acquire land and reestablish a name for himself. Even people that we'd recognize, like Andrew Jackson, a future president. Uh, and in doing so, gets himself in a sticky situation uh, that Thomas Jefferson, no longer an ally, uh, but, but current sitting president of the United States, finds quite concerning. Uh, in fact, Burr marches a small armed group of settlers to an unmonitored tract of land, and Jefferson doesn't know if he wants that land to be his own or if, uh, if Burr is actually trying to do something in honor of the United States, either way, he didn't ask. Uh, and, and Jefferson um, has has Burr caught in Alabama and brought up, indicted for treason. So I guess uh, Burr was writing letters to the French and to the English, yes. trying to help them secure land. And so people were thinking, you know, is he trying to create his own nation or what's going on here? Absolutely, that, and that's what's happening. As Burr is working alongside a general from, from England, he's also working a little bit with France. Um, he's on the fringe of, of what's actually Spanish territory at the time. And uh, Burr's fatal flaw actually, even when it comes to the duel, is that he, uh, he never articulates his clear thoughts. He's very careful about his word choice uh, in an age where we think of people like Washington, Jefferson, and Hamilton, who are verbose and honest and frank. And, and that scares some people. And it also leads some people to make some assumptions about him. Uh, he doesn't fight back. He doesn't fight back for the decade that Hamilton uh, published about him in the newspaper. And he doesn't clarify what he was doing um, with that, that tract of land. So it was easy for newspapers to think, oh, he wants to create his own country. Yeah. He's the scoundrel that's trying to undermine Thomas Jefferson. But ultimately, uh, he wasn't convicted. He wasn't. He was acquitted of all charges. Um, and that's actually vastly interesting. His case is the first case of treason against the new US Constitution. Um, and John Marshall is stuck defining what is treason? What does it mean to, to turn your back on the Constitution? And in the end, it's actually um, a little bit of legality that gets him out. It's, it's not quite meeting a definition of having two people who are willing to, to stand uh, witness for this and also not having a clear overt act. And, and that's why he's acquitted on words. Now, one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition is his obituary on the bottom of a band box. Talk absolutely. to me about that. Yeah, this was a, an absolutely exciting find. Um, a band box that was made probably in the 1830s or 40s. Uh, Burr didn't die until 1836, um, which was just made for storage, for holding hats, and was living on the top of a dresser, among other band boxes here at Winter Tour. Uh, has a newspaper stuck to the bottom, which is quite common for band boxes, but this one has, has Burr's obituary, and it describes him in a way that recognizes he's done some evil, but hopes that in the future we will let his, uh, his transgressions go and remember his greatness. And all of that is just hiding under this little, little box, and it really reshapes the way that uh, we think about Burr's memory and when that might have been invented. All righty, thank you very much. We're going to be right back and talk more about Hamilton and Burr. My name is Jeff Nodner. I'm the pianist with the Cartoon Christmas Trio, and I'm jamming on the 302 with me and you. Welcome back. We're talking about Hamilton and Burr, who wrote their stories. I'm joined by Rebecca Duffy. Now, Rebecca, there are so many amazing artifacts in this exhibition. The one that really, we talked about the band box, but there's also a portrait 
of uh, Theodosia Burr. Talk to me a little bit about her and how, I guess, how her story ends. <laughs> yeah, the, it's a really special piece, and, and Theodosia was a very special woman. Uh, Theodosia was the daughter of Aaron Burr and also her mother, Theodosia. Uh, and her mother dies quite young, uh, but Burr is smitten from the moment that his daughter, Theo, as he calls her, uh, was born. And when, when her mother passes away, Theo really takes over the house for Burr and also maintaining his friendships and his networks. Um, we've got this really fabulous, really unique uh, miniature portrait of her in here um, that was actually done by Mary Way, an artist with her own fascinating story um, from Connecticut and includes little bits of cut paper and fabric to give it a really three-dimensional touch and it's, it's just honestly quite darling. Um, and, and that's the way I like to imagine that, uh, that Aaron Burr pictured his Theo when, when he wasn't with her. And certainly this artifact is something that that family would have held and passed along to each other, which, which is quite unique. Uh, but Theo's story is one um, that's laid in, and it's almost like, a, I, I don't know, a drama or a tragedy that yeah. we see on TV. Uh, Theo lives her life with Aaron Burr. She's married and moves to South Carolina um, with Joseph Alston, which is um, by all means a relatively happy uh, marriage, but Theo is plagued with illness pretty quickly uh, as she arrives in South Carolina and continuously ill. Um, following Aaron Burr's trial for treason, he leaves and he lives in an exile in Europe for about 10 years. He doesn't see his daughter and that's the hardest thing for him. When he returns, all he can think is that he can't wait to see Theo and his grandson, Aaron Burr Alston. You can imagine how the Alstons felt about that. Sure. Um, once again, and, and in three months time, uh, before he even sees them, Aaron Burr Alston dies of a childhood fever. And uh, Theo, when she gathers herself um, to get on a ship uh, to see her father who's living in New York, uh, finds herself in the midst of War of 1812 and her ship goes missing off the coast of North Carolina, never to be seen again. Uh, and there's wild fan fiction about what might have happened to her, but at the end of the day, um, that was the death blow for Burr. He, he never really recovers from the loss of his daughter, um, who spent so many years ensuring that we remembered some really fabulous things about Burr and, and even writing to the Madison uh, White House to request his safe passage back to the United States. Now, I know a lot of his papers actually went missing. Now, did they go missing in the when she was lost at, at, at sea or? Um, it's possible that some did then. Uh, I think uh, most of them actually went missing following his death, and that's a really good point. When he loses his daughter, whom he he calls uh, the most dear thing to him, uh, second being his reputation, uh, he ends up living in relative animity. Uh, he resumes his law practice in New York. Uh, he's kind of living under the radar. He's no longer a threat to the politics um, of the day. And ultimately, he dies in a boarding house on Staten Island. Uh, there are some accounts just a few years before that of people saying, I think I walked by Aaron Burr today, but oh. I don't remember what he looks like. Uh, and, and that's probably what ended up happening to his papers. There's no one really there to save them. Now, switching gears, right behind us is a jacket. It's, uh, I guess, depictive of what was worn at the time, but that's yeah. not actually Hamilton or Burr's jacket, It's correct? not. The, the jacket is neither Hamilton nor Burr's, but it is an incredible rare survival. Um, it's a fabulous example of a purple, purple velvet coat from the time, uh, which is sort of reminiscent of the costumes in, in the Hamilton musical, uh, and is reminiscent of the objects that really inspired uh, bringing this narrative to life in, in a production type of way. Uh, but it but it is a, quite a unique object, and it's it's lived here at Wintertour for some time, but this is actually its first time yeah. uh, in an exhibition since it's gotten here. And the Washington service in the corner. Yeah, uh, we've also got uh, a little bit of our Order of Cincinnati service owned by uh, George Washington. And George Washington had this service made um, in China, it's Chinese porcelain, uh, and sent to his home in the United States. States, uh, Wintertour actually has the largest collection of Order of Cincinnati uh, ceramics owned by, owned by Washington. It also offers us a really nice occasion uh, to think about the relationships between Aaron Burr and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and George Washington, which were quite different. Definitely, and it was also the first uh, shipment from China to the United States, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, just to add another something special to that collection, uh, they came across on, on the first ship actually to be sent to the new United States. Excellent. So 
The entire exhibition, there's so much interest in this subject right now because of the musical. What do you think about the musical and, and what it's done for this piece of history? Yeah, that, that's so important. The musical is central to our popular culture. It's central to the way we're digging into and reinterpreting this narrative. And in many ways, uh, as historians, we can't thank the musical enough uh, for reigniting a, a large and wide interest in a narrative that was largely lost for, for quite some time. Um, I mean, Lin-Manuel says himself that he's right reclaiming the $10 founding father, and, and we can't thank him for that. But he also, um, inserts some really important uh, points that discuss some really poignant arguments about immigration, about citizenship in the United States that make it a little more comfortable for historians and guests and visitors alike to reconsider the ways that these folks actually shaped our, our present that we're living in and, and to recontextualize uh, the way that we consider the past relevancy to our own lives. Well, Rebecca, thank you very much for sharing all of this with us. It certainly is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming out today. All righty, and we'll be right back. That'll do it for this episode. For more information on Winter Tour's exhibits, make sure you check out wintertour.org. We're going to leave you with some beauty shots of Winter Tour's gardens. I'm Jackie Ferris. We'll see you next time on the 302.